Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Can't believe this week's over already, you know. I was trying to find out in the Word of God if there's a scripture that said time seem, would seem like it's moving faster in the last of the last days, but I don't know about you guys. It seems like time is just flying by. Yeah, I mean, here we are. It's the middle of May. It just feels like it was the middle of last May. You know, I was just thinking, about, I have the I have uh, guys coming over to open my pool today, and I was like, man, didn't we just close the pool? <laughs> but it's all good, right? You know, the Word of God says that God tells time a little bit differently than we do, um, and our life here is just a vapor, but that vapor we spend here can be a great vapor, right? Um, you know, God's, God's promises, uh, the will of God for our lives, which contains his promises, are promises that are of a hope and a future. To really bring the desires of our heart into manifestation as long as our hearts are right towards him. Amen? And, uh, you know, I've just been contemplating these last couple weeks, um, really since God had put on my heart uh, right before thanks or Thanksgiving, well, right before Easter. No, we're not there yet. It's not going that fast, right? Right before Easter about just comprehending or trying to really have that more deep, intimate revelation of the love of God, you know, and how that love really is a conduit to work through us, you know, to, to touch other people. Um, so glory to God, he is good, right? So we're going to continue down the road of uh, where I've been, uh, what I've, we've been talking about every time I've been with you guys, and what we've been looking at is manifestations of healings and the approaches that were taken by the individuals and by Jesus where these manifestations of healing uh, came to be. So if you have your Bibles, I just want to just refresh just a little bit of where we left off last week, and then we're going to move on to another area. So you can turn over your Bibles, the new place we're going to go to, which is Luke chapter 17. And while you guys are doing that, let's pray. So Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here this morning. We come to you as touching faith and healing school, believing you and asking you for the anointing, the anointing that's on your word to minister to our hearts today. And as each one of us came expecting to receive from you, we know that since the word never returns void, we can expect to receive. And we thank you for revelation knowledge. Uh, you know exactly what each and every one of us needs. You know where we're at. And we just know that you will be giving us revelation this morning. And we thank you for it in advance. And we say bring glory to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So without going back to you know, refocus on everything we've already studied and looked at, um, just kind of to recap, we looked at a few different instances contained inside the Word of God where healing manifested. And first and foremost, we looked at it from an approach of proactive faith. And we specifically were looking at the woman with the issue of blood and Jairus, right? Both of them did what? They had heard about Jesus. You know, I actually heard Pastor Eddie on Tuesday talking about the same thing. And it's so important because how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing. They heard something about Jesus, right? So their faith started to get sparked. And then what did they do? They pursued after him. Both Jairus and both the woman with the issue of blood pursued after him. And quite honestly, they had a fight to get to him, right? We know the crowds, a multitude of people surrounding him as he moved, right, from place to place. They had a fight through the crowd. We know the women with the issue of the blood touched the fringe of Jesus's garment, meaning there's a really good chance if you look it up that he, she was crawling on the ground in a last ditch effort all she could to get to him. Jairus, right? Same thing. He comes to Jesus. His situation a little bit different. Woman with the issue of blood, instant manifestation when she touched his garment of her healing. Jairus, situation got a little bit worse. Servants come to him, your daughter's dead. But Jesus tells him, fear not, just believe. Goes to the house, we know what happens. His daughter is healed, right? And then we looked at, we tried, kind of went over to the, the man with uh, the son who had, was demon-possessed. Same thing. Heard, sought after, so proactive. Same thing. Gets in front of Jesus with his son. Things don't instantaneously get better. 
quite honestly, they immediately got worse because we know that spirit, that demonic spirit convulsed the boy right at Jesus' feet. But was Jesus moved by any of that? No. Do we know for sure if the, the father was 100% in faith? Well, we can infer that he wasn't by what he said. When he said to Jesus, if you can do anything. But we know that he could. But Jesus didn't say, oh, of course I can do it. It's me. I'm Jesus. You know who I am. I got this. No, he didn't, right? He encouraged the father that faith was the component that would manifest the healing of his son. And pretty soon there, like within seconds of it getting worse, obviously the healing manifested itself. So we see inside those situations pretty quick manifestations of healing. They came, some things happened, but really within the time frame that was pretty short, healing manifested. Then we looked at the man by the pool of Bethesda. Wasn't proactive. We don't even know if he really knew who Jesus was. He didn't go after Jesus. Jesus went after him. And we kind of looked at that from a perspective of um, having that one-on-one experience, maybe under the context of like a new believer, who first time they've come to a church, you know, a church like this where there's manifestations of the Spirit in action inside the church. They were touched in their heart by something that's happened, an experience, a one-on-one experience with Jesus. And what did that lead to for this man? Despite being in that condition for 38 years, Jesus comes on the scene and this man is healed. But what I wanted to just reinforce this morning, because it's so important, you know, faith and healing class is all about getting more revelation and more light on the fact that it is God's will to heal today. It's never passed away. It's never been done away with. Quite the opposite. Healing belongs to every believer. As long as we get into the word, just like those proactive people did, and see for ourselves that it belongs to us. But just because we see it and we believe it, does that mean it's going to instantaneously manifest all the time? No. We have to what? Lay hold of it by faith. We gotta fight the good fight of faith. We gotta press through the lies of the enemy coming against us, telling us how in the world can you be healed if this is still going on? The man by the pool of Bethesda, 38 years, long time. The woman with the issue of blood, 12 years, a long time. I'd venture to guess in everybody who's listening here in person and via live stream, that maybe there's something you've been believing God for for a long time. But does time matter to God? And how do we know that? Because the Word of God tells us His timing is perfect. Now, people will say, well, if His timing's perfect and it's His will for me to walk in divine health and healing, why doesn't His time come? Why doesn't healing happen right this second? Well, quite honestly, I can't answer that for an individual situation. I can tell you this, that God's plan is perfect and his timing's perfect. Meaning, if you're waiting on the Lord for something, and that something might be your healing, it might be something else, that the word of God promises us that while we're waiting, if we grow, don't grow weary and faint not, we're being strengthened in that wait time. Our faith is being grown. We're being taught how to stand through things. Because once we receive the manifestation of what we're believing God for, our journey doesn't end there. Our journey is always a journey of faith where we're continuing every day to believe God for something. You know, I say this all the time. You guys hear me say it, but it always bears repeating. If you're not believing God for anything, you need to start believing God for something because that's how our faith grows. And if if we're all endeavoring or desiring to come up to a higher level, we need to believe God. End of sentence. You know, I I said this in a message I gave. I don't even know what message it was, but I kind of made a statement, and people looked at me a little funny. And take it under the context of what I'm about to say. In that message, I said, we need to stop believing God. And people were like, what are you talking about? What do you mean we stopped believing God? No. We need to stop believing God, meaning we need to just believe God. 
believing has a connotation attached to it that we might stop. But if I say, I believe God, that's it, it's finished, it's complete, it's a done deal. Now, the, when Jesus talked to Jairus, did he say, start believing me? Or did he say, just believe? That's what I'm talking about. We just need to believe God. Yes, we are believing, but we're believing in a way that's never gonna stop. We're always gonna believe God for something, right? And then what I wanted to just finish this little review was the man by the pool of Bethesda has a lot in common with all of us and some things that we do as believers in Christ that we shouldn't. And what did he do when Jesus asked him a simple question? And we'd like to say that that question would be, yes, sir. But the question was, do you want to be made well? And he's like, well, hang on here. I got a problem. Gave him every excuse under the sun why he couldn't get healed. Jesus didn't ask him, why aren't you healed? Jesus isn't asking us today, why aren't we healed? Jesus is asking, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be made well? It's a simple question that only has one or two answers. It's either yes or no. And if we're in Christ and we know that healing belongs to us, that answer better be yes, sir. Because why? It's already been done. He's made provision for it. But yet, we can give excuses at times. Or we can give rationalizations as to why we don't have yet what we're believing God for. And when we go down that road, that's a dangerous road. Because now we're operating not God's faith way. We're operating the enemy, enemy wants us to operate, which is in false reasonings and leaning on our own understanding. Don't try, if you're standing on the word, in faith for anything, your healing, your finances, your children, relationships, whatever. If you're standing in faith, do not try to reason out how God's going to bring it. Just know, just believe, and know that he will bring it to fruition. Because he is not a man that he would lie. There's only one liar in this spiritual battle we're in, and that's the enemy. Everything he does wants to talk you out of what belongs to you. You know, if you go to the bank today and you have a safe deposit box at the bank and you know it's in your safe deposit box, right? And you go there and you open it up. Can anybody talk you out of the fact that that belongs to you? Well, you have a safe deposit box right here inside the word for your safety. You know, the acronym we always use, basic instruction before leaving earth. But we can walk in the prosperity and the supernatural protection of God because it's all contained inside the word of God. But if we don't walk in it and just believe, we can get ourselves in trouble. We don't want to be making excuses why. Because when we start making excuses why, we're not in faith. We're actually in something else, whether it be fear, doubt, worry, or unbelief, right? But when we look at excuses from a perspective of our walk with the Lord, you know, I've heard all these things, and I know we talked about them last week, I just wanted to reinforce them, from believers, not unbelievers, from believers. Excuses like, I don't have time to go to church, right? You don't have time not to go to church. Does that make sense? Sort of does, right? You have to. No, no, it's a priority. God should be first place in your life. Part of that priority is getting to church. Now, that doesn't, what we talked about, replace your personal time in the Word. But that's the other excuse we have. I don't have time to read the Bible. You, you do have time. And if you truly want to have a victorious life, then what do we need to do? It's that one word that people cringe at when you say it, and, it's a, and that word is commitment. Unless you are willing to make a commitment to the kingdom of God and his ways and his ways of doing things by spending time in the word, then whose fault is it that we don't have the manifestations of what we're believing God for? It's a commitment, a lifestyle. 
You know, this is where you get off into religion. Religion kills. Organized religion can kill. It's relational. It's relationship-driven. It's you and God, right? And we need to spend that time. Who has time for prayer? We hear things about that all the time. Well, if you really break apart your day every day, I'm a scheduler. For those of you who know me, if my wife was here, she knows this. If you look at my calendar from Monday through Friday, Saturday and Sunday, a little more flexible. I don't have as much going on on the weekends. Um, But I have time broken down on my calendar in color codes from 7 a.m. to 10 o'clock at night. And everything I need to do based on what I need to do is in a specific color. So, and I'm not saying you guys have to do this, but it makes you more aware of time. We need to get up every day with a plan. Is God the God of order? He's an orderly God, but yet we can be not orderly people. You know, I see so many people, believers, fail. I see people in general fail for, because they have an inability to manage time. Time is important, and God will redeem the time as long as we put him first place. So like I was saying, my, my, my days are color-coded. What do I need to do for my business? What do, that's a blue color. If I have an appointment, it's a purple color. If it's something church-related or ministry-related, it's a green color. What does that do? And in the morning, I have yellow for my personal reading time and red for my gym days. Why do I have that? Keeps me aware of time but it also keeps me focused on what's important. Now, if a green thing, meaning church, ministry, or yellow, which is my personal time in the Lord, is not subject to a specific time, like I don't have something to do ministry-wise at like 10.30 this morning, those yellow and green things I endeavor to always do first. Why? God is first place in my life and has to be. But it comes with a commitment. You know, people, like I said, the excuses, I can't pray, I can't spend time in the Word, I don't have time to go to church. They're just that. They're excuses. Sometimes it comes, and I get it, days can be busy. If you've got kids at home, it can be hectic. But that may require a couple things. It may require you needing to get up a little bit earlier and go to bed a little bit earlier. You know, I... Do, I don't post much on Facebook. It's just usually business-related or something we're doing here related. But I, I check out Facebook, and I see people I know up, and I'm talking Christians. I'm not saying they're not reading or anything or spending time in the Word, but they're up at 1 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning, based on the times they're posting stuff. Now, if you're doing that, and I don't know who you are, I'm not specifying anybody, but if you're doing that and then tell me you don't have time to spend in the Word... Maybe you need to go to bed at 9.30. i got to be honest with you. Most nights, the latest I'm laying in bed by is 10, usually somewhere around 9.30, and that's me and Jody both. Why? Well, I want to get up at no later than 6.30. 6.30 makes my day work. It's my schedule. Actually, it's a little bit earlier. My personal reading time is scheduled in for 7, but I really like to get it started by no later than 6.30. Why? I need, we need to be aware of time so that we don't do what? Make excuses why we can't do something that's important to our walk with God. Amen? And then lastly, we looked at um, with the man uh, by the pool of Bethesda. When he finally got a revelation, yeah, I want to be made well. Let's do this, right? Jesus told him, get up, pick up your bed, and walk. And we looked at the illustration of take up your bed really meant from what I had seen through another study I'd done with another minister who who was teaching along these lines was the bed was a representation of your comfort zone. God wants to stretch you. He wants to yank you outside your comfort zone because when you do that, that's when growth takes place. You know, that's when growth takes place. And then finally, he he tells the man to go on, you know, get out of here, walk. And really when we're walking, after we receive our healing, it really, it really denotes the fact that we're now walking in victory and need to maintain that victory. Amen? So now where I wanted to go is we've looked at proactive faith, we've looked at reactive faith. And the proactive faith, for example, had pretty quick manifestations attached to the healing, right? From 
all the ones we just looked at. Now I wanted to look another way where healing happens. And uh, I told you guys to turn over to Luke chapter 17. And what I wanted to look at this morning is being healed as you go. All right, so I'm going to start reading in verse 11, and I'm reading this out of the Amplified. And it says this, as he went on his way to Jerusalem, it occurred that Jesus was passing along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And as he was going into one village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance. And they raised up their voices and called, Jesus, Master, take pity and have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, go at once and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cured and, and made clean. The one, then one of them, upon seeing that he was cured, turned back, recognizing and thanking and praising God with a loud voice. And he fell prostrate at Jesus' feet, thanking him over and over, and he was a Samaritan. That's significant. We're going to take a look at that in a second. But then Jesus asked, Where, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was there no one found to return and to recognize and give thanks and praise to God except this alien? Now, what, what, what's going on here? So you've got ten lepers. He's, Jesus is moving between Samaria and Galilee. We all know the relationship that the Samaritans had with the Jews. Not a good one, right? And I, when I said, it's, is it no coincidence, or it's interesting that the leper who turned back to him was a Samaritan. Now, at the beginning of this verse of Scripture, it says, um, as, as Jesus came on the scene, the lepers, and they raised up their voices and called Jesus, uh, Master, take pity and mercy on us. Now, it doesn't specifically say, it just says, and they raised up their voices. Our, you know, if we look at that, we can kind of infer it was all 10 of them raised up their voices, right? And what's interesting is we know that Samaritans and Jews didn't like each other, and they didn't have a beliefs, or their beliefs didn't line up either. Yet this man, if he was a Samaritan, can we glean from this that if he raised up his voice and said, Master, that he may have also heard something about Jesus, recognizing whom he was, or heard about the miracles and signs and wonders that he was doing. There's a good chance he also heard. You know, because they didn't like, they didn't, and we don't see this in the scripture, it's not like they ran over to this person. Quite honestly, as lepers, they couldn't come close to anybody. They couldn't go in a city. From the Jewish perspective, they were ceremonial ceremonially unclean. You know, if they walked into a city or walked into the presence of people who were healthy, they could be stoned to death, right? So not much different than the woman with the issue of blood in her state could have also been stoned because she was also considered unclean. You know, I think about that. I think about the law, right? That under those circumstances, they were so unclean. And we know that the law was impossible to keep. And it was just showing the Jews, that they needed a savior. Because no one, no one person could keep that law perfectly. And yet, they despised people who were sick and ill, considering them unclean. But Jesus said, no, you're my children. I'm going to take your leprosy. I'm going to take your issue of blood to the cross. Now, that's for us today. But Jesus was on the scene here. So what did Jesus do? We'll deal with this right now before I go to the cross. Amen? So personally, our covenant, much better. And we know that based on much better promises as a completed work, right? So these guys, lepers, what happens were they instantaneously healed when Jesus spoke to them? They were healed as they went. The reason why I wanted to talk about this a little bit this morning, and maybe we'll have time to get into another area too I wanted to look at, is many believers, and I, this, and I think this is the context of it, they know healing belongs to them, Maybe they're in a prayer line, you know, a prayer line for healing, um, having hands laid on them or something like that. But even if you, if you know healing belongs to you and you have faith to receive it, 
That's it. It's done, right? It's done. But I think a lot of believers miss it because their faith isn't 100% firm. And when I've had hands laid on me, do we always instantaneously feel anything? Do we have to necessarily feel healed? Do the symptoms when your hands, hands are laid on you necessarily instantaneously go away? Certainly they can. But doesn't mean that healing didn't happen, wasn't released, right? That you didn't release your faith for healing. And then what happens? You're healed as you go. You know, when you look at, for those of us who read Brother Hagen's health food, how many instances in his ministry do we see him laying hands on somebody, somebody who had faith to know that healing belonged to them and received it, and then he'll say, that woman wasn't any better a second after I prayed. Quite honestly, I saw this person loaded back in the ambulance the same way they came, and then what? He gets a letter, a phone call, three weeks later, healed as you go. But there's an important component to that. If we're in a situation where we know healing's ours, and again, this also goes for you don't have to have hands laid on you to receive healing. It belongs to you. Take it yourself right now. That's per perfectly acceptable to do. If not acceptable, it's what we should be doing. Or it could be in a service, a healing line, whatever. But if there isn't an instantaneous manifestation, we can look at this verse of Scripture and say, well, then I'm just going to be healed as I go. And the important part of that is the switch of faith needs to stay on. Because if it's not here yet, means you're going to still need active, alive, sold out to the word kind of faith that doesn't waver, that doesn't shrink back, that doesn't let go. Because you're going to be healed as you go, which means the enemy's got a couple of opportunities to try to come in along the way and talk you out of your healing. Not unlike what happened to Jairus when, oh, good, I got to Jesus. This is going to be awesome. Hey, your daughter's dead. Sorry, don't bug him anymore. Talk about getting kicked in the gut. But what did Jesus say? If we're being healed as we go, Jesus is saying the same thing to us. He said to Jairus, fear not, just believe. If you, if you were prayed for, if you received it yourself, it's yours. Now, do we have to pray again? No, that's where we miss it, right? Believers miss it. I prayed for something but I don't have it yet. And tomorrow, what do we do? We pray again. Praying again tells God, did you, did you believe me yesterday? Or you just thought I was playing? If you believe my word's true, and you prayed according to the word for something that belongs to you, do we need to pray again, or do we just need to be in an attitude of gratitude and thanksgiving, knowing that he who is faithful, will perform his word. As we're what? Healed as we go. We just got to keep thanking God. You know, I think it was Rick Renner, I don't know if it was yesterday or this morning. Days kind of meld together. But he was talking about, when was the last time you thanked God for anything? But we as believers should be in a consistent attitude of gratitude. And being grateful is not predicated on being delivered or even, or even having a manifestation of victory. Being gratitude is what's going to help to manifest the victory. Grateful for where you are right now. You know, there's people, certainly in the world, and even Christians who never had light on the subject that divine health and healing belongs to them that didn't wake up this morning. You know, we, 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 it's a privilege to live in the United States, to have everything that we have. As much as we can complain about this, that, and the other thing, oh, the pipeline got hacked. With, you know, our friends that were up here the other weekend, Richie and Rose are down in Virginia, and they're experiencing this whole gas shortage thing. And she called Jody yesterday. She goes, it's crazy. I went to two gas stations, couldn't get gas, you know. 
and we complain and we complain, yet there's somebody over in Africa that's walking barefoot to a dirty stream to get water. We need to be grateful right where we're at. We need to be grateful that, as of right now, we're not persecuted for our beliefs. Will we see some of that change? Well, stay tuned. We are living in the last of the last days. But we need to cultivate an attitude of gratitude where we're at. And it was no coincidence when I was reading, uh, where did that go? When I was reading the, one of the devotions, I think it was, I know it was Healthwood the other day, yesterday, today. And I had come in here Tuesday. I was here for Faith and Healing School, and then we had a meeting. And I took a wrong step. Nothing, nothing crazy. I had went to, I went to the gym that morning. Whatever, I was fine. I came in here right by the sound booth where Tom is to the right back there, and I stepped, and my knee went out. I'm like, what's that? You know, I said that to myself. Like, what the heck is that? I didn't say anything. I didn't say. I didn't even say, "Ouch, it hurt." And I'm like, and I've had that happen before but not in that knee. It used to be my left knee would go out, a little meniscus kind of thing. And I'm like, anybody ever see that Ace Ventura movie when he's got the spear in his leg? And I'm like, ah! Right? That's what you want to do. And Jody knows this because I came home, and I'm like, this is weird. That whole day, pain, ache, hurt, you know? And, again, I'm a human being, right? I... We talk about faith and healing all the time. I just went home and dealt with it. Bozo that I was at the time, right? And I, the next morning I woke up and I said, wait a second. I sat down, I got up out of bed, and I'm coming down the stairs, and it was hurting me going down the stairs. I didn't say anything that I was in pain, I didn't, but I didn't do anything proactive either, right? I walked down the stairs, and I had this little area in my living room where I read, and I sat down, I started reading the devotions, now, how important is it to spend time in the Word? I preach health and healing all the time and did nothing proactively. Shame on me, right? Just didn't even think about it. Should have been foremost in my mind, but I missed it. And I'm reading, I don't know, health food, and I'm like, yeah, wait a second. And I'm, the way I, I sit on the couch, and I shouldn't, I sit on my leg because it's comfortable for me, right? I just do that, and it's a nice soft couch. And it's hurting, and it's throbbing. I went... No, 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 no. This can't stand in my body. This has no legal right. It doesn't matter if it was a football injury, a baseball injury, a wrestling injury, whatever from years ago. It has no legal right to stay in my body. And right on the spot, I'm like, Lord, I'm sorry. I missed it. I didn't pray yesterday. I rebuked the enemy. I said, get your hands off my mortal body. I bind you up and shut you down because the word says Jesus himself took my infirmity. This is an infirmity to the cross and you can get lost, devil. I have zero pain. Literally within 15 minutes, the pain was gone. Why? The word always works. It always works. Now, if I prayed and something didn't manifest, does that mean God's word is false? No, it just means what? I was going to be healed as I go. Actually, I didn't feel 100%. And now, here's where the enemy comes. I did go to the, I was going to the gym. And I did go to the gym. And I'm like, well, it was a day where I was just going to do like a treadmill day after my workout. And I'm like, should I really walk on the treadmill because my, and I went, wait a second. Healed people get up and act like they're healed. So I did 30 minutes on the treadmill, Right? Got off the treadmill, fine. But why? I was kind of healed as I went. I just took a couple hours or whatever. Or if it takes a couple days or a couple years or a couple weeks, you're being healed as you go. As long as we received it and we believe it and we're sold out to it and we just keep thanking God for it. That's what, how we have to receive everything from God. Amen? So these guys, though, we see that in this verse of Scripture when ten guys are made well and one comes back. The one specifically mentioned as a Samaritan. And again, the Word of God doesn't say this, but I always wonder when I read this. If the other nine, let's say they weren't Samaritans, and again, we don't know that. 
He's in the region between Galilee and Samaria, so they very well could have been either. But let's say they were Jews. Do you think they were too rooted and grounded in religion to come back and really recognize who Jesus was? That he was the Son of God, not just this person who was going around healing people. And this Samaritan, because this was kind of new to him, had such childlike faith that he needed to run back to Jesus and say, thanks. Childlike faith just believes, right? To have faith like a child. Jesus talked about it himself. We need to have faith like a child. Why? Because childlike faith believes. It just believes. You can tell a little one anything. Oh, you know, in, in four hours, I'm going to get you a pet lion. And they'll be looking, standing at the window looking for the lion. Now, don't lie to your kids, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. They're going to believe it. They're going to believe it. Actually, they expect it. You know, when my kids were young and we were like, go to Disney or something, the last thing I was going to do is tell them a month before that we're going to Disney at such and such a date. I'd never hear the end of it. We're going to Disney. We're going to Disney. Yo, we're going to Disney. Right? But we should have that same attitude. We are told that we're doing something or getting something. I'm going to be healed. My healing's here. My healing's coming. That's childlike faith. I don't care what I see. I don't care what I feel. It's mine. Just like those kids, if you tell them two months ahead of time they're going to Disney, that belongs to them and they know it. And even if they know the date is coming, they're already getting worked up about it. Why? Because they're expecting it. And they're, they got it all worked out and how awesome it's going to be. We need to have that same approach where the word is concerned. Not if God's going to do it. What's it going to look like when he does it? No. I'm just excited he's doing it. And it's going to happen. As long as we don't let go. It's that simple. Right? Amen. So I want to kind of transition into, so we've looked at proactive, reactive, and uh, what do we call this one? Healed as they went, right? But now I wanted to look at another way healing manifests. And of course, we see this a lot inside church circles. That is, somebody brings you or intercedes on your behalf. Okay, because that's another way. We're going to look at two specific stories where that's concerned. We're not going to get to both today. So let's, uh, let's switch over to Mark chapter 8, and let's read verse 22. Let's start in 22. Again, I'm reading out of the Amplified. And they came to Bethsaida, and people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. Now, did this guy go to... Does the, does the scripture infer that this guy sought after Jesus himself or that somebody brought him and somebody else was doing the talking? This man wasn't doing the talking, right? They came to Bethsaida and people brought to him a blind man to Jesus and begged him to touch him, okay? So this guy wasn't proactively seeking. Obviously, being blind, it would have been difficult for him to do so, obviously, without help, but He's not the one doing talking. Verse 23, and he caught the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. Hang on to that. Remember that was said. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him, do you possibly see anything? Now, every time I read this scripture, I'm like, Jesus is just like so cool. You know, we're going to lead you out of the village. I'm just going to spit. <laughs> but we're going to see maybe why he did that, okay, from the context of the verses. And put his hands on him, which was not unusual for Jesus, and asked him, do you possibly see anything? Verse 24. And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Stop there for a second. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but I wanted to bring it up here. So when he says, I see trees, uh, and I see people, but they look like trees, what does that tell us? He saw at some other point in his life. It wasn't, if he had never seen before, he couldn't say that. He couldn't say, I see people, but they look like trees. He wouldn't know what a person or a tree looked like. So we know that he had seen, or was it capable of seeing at some time before his blindness. And that's significant when we get in to start talking about why did Jesus spit, okay? Then he put his hands on his eyes again 
and the man looked intently, that is, fixed his eyes on definite objects. And he was restored and saw everything distinctly, even what was at a distance. And he sent him away to his house, telling him, do not even enter the village or tell anyone there. There is a lot going on in this story contained in these verses of Scripture where healing's concerned. And certainly for us today. You know, when I think about people coming to being brought to church, well, our job as believers is to what? Invite people to church all the time. And if we invite them, right, they might know nothing about the things of God. Maybe they know something. Maybe they actually, you know, followed God and just backslid, walked away or whatever. But when we're interceding on the behalf of others, now, I also want us to look at the context of our own healing inside this scripture, but also ministering healing to others. Because faith and healing school has always been about us receiving our healing, but also being able to take it to others, right? So we're bringing people, right, that either don't know anything, know something, or just walked away. And in this particular case, that intercession by his friends manifested what in his body? A one-on-one, first of all, one-on-one encounter with the master, and secondly, healing for him. Amen? So that's why it's so important that we don't just sit on what we learn. We need to take it out there. Amen? So I want to look a little deeper. We have a little time left. Uh, Let's kind of start back fresh from the beginning of where we were in Mark 8, 22. And they came to Beth, Beth, Bethsaida, and people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. So, we don't know if this man had faith or not, but we do know his friends did. Faith in something, whether they knew Jesus was the Messiah, or at least, we don't know, but did they have faith enough maybe they had seen or heard about his healing ministry and had faith in, it, in that, we don't know. But they had some sort of faith because they said, hey, look, touch him. They begged him, touch him, right? We don't know if the man had faith, right? But did they hear about what Jesus was doing and they just wanted to see another miracle? Did they honestly believe he was the Messiah? We don't know. They knew something, though. I want to read this out of my notes. It's recorded in this account that some people brought this blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. The people could have been bringing the blind man to Jesus because he was part of their village and they cared for his well-being, right? He came from this specific village with his friends. Or, on the other hand, maybe they just simply desired to see a miracle performed by Jesus themselves. We don't know. But they had faith in something, right? They were looking for anyone to be healed so they could witness firsthand Christ's miraculous power. The good news for this guy, no matter what their motive was, they had confidence that Jesus would be able to do something great. Again, it's the faith like a mustard seed. You know, if we, if every body of believer or every person and every body of believers in the world knew that they knew that they knew that Jesus is able to do something great, think about that. Because unfortunately, there's believers sitting in churches, sitting at home, really don't believe anything. Meaning they believe Jesus is who he is, but that's where it stops. So for them, it stops at their salvation. And God never intended us to stop at our salvation. You know, we always used to use the expression, we got to stop hanging around the cross. Why? He's not there. I'm having trouble hearing you. That's the second time that happened. He's not on the cross anymore. We need to go through it. We need to go through the cross because the cross is a completed work. There's so much more, though. And we always say this. You know, if it was just about our salvation and God's plan of redemption was only just that, about just redeeming us back to him to be in fellowship with God so we could spend eternity with him in heaven, that would be enough. But really, the truth is, here saying that God desires so much more for us here on earth. And it's up to us, right? It's up to us to see it for ourselves. 
like I just said earlier, we can also make that assumption that this blind man did not make his way to Jesus by himself or of his own volition. He couldn't. He was blind. But this is a glowing example of maybe we're dealing with something where we don't know, we don't have light. You know, I talked to somebody the other day, and they know about healing, but yet they're not sold out. It belongs to them. You know, and I was like, but if you know about it and you're kind of okay with it with some other people, you need to get that revelation that it's yours, you know, that it belongs to you. And because it does. It's not, God's no respecter of persons. So if it belongs to them, it belongs to you. It has to be. If it didn't, that would make God a respecter of persons. So we can assume that this man took, uh, didn't come to Jesus by himself. So it, and really what this is telling us we were designed for this walk with God to not go it alone. Of course, you know, we always say we have Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit to guide us. But we were also knit purposely into a body of believers. Why? So that we wouldn't have to go this alone. You know, how many times over all these years in ministry where I've had people like, we don't see them in church for a while, and we, we get a hold of them call them up finally, right? And I'm like, where you been? Well, I'm going through something. Why aren't you here? Well, I'm going through something. And this is, I'm telling you, this happens. I'm like, I'm going through something. Okay, why aren't you in church? I don't want everybody to know. Well, not everybody's going to know, but you're not designed to do this by yourself. We're here to strengthen you, build you up, find somebody that you know, that you, you know, that you mesh with that you know sold out to the truth of the word, that will stand with you, will help you through your walk with God. And it doesn't have to be one of us as the pastors or the elders. You guys are all awesome together. You know, everybody in our church, I believe this in my heart of hearts, knows the word, would be more than happy to stand with another believer through things. But yet people retreat from the environment of you know, the body of believers that they've been called to be in fellowship with because they're going through something. Now, if you're the kind of believer that says, you know what, I got, you know, me and God got this. I'm going to stand on the word. But what that's going to show me is you're never going to stop and shrink back from coming to church if you're going through something. Quite the opposite. You're going to go about life as the way it should be, normal, in church, every time the doors are, are open. And you know what? If you're truly sold out to the truth of the word, we're never going to know you're going through anything. Because what? It's going to be business as usual, right? So both of those ways are important. I'm going to stop there because I don't want to get into new ground or, or kind of where we're at, go a little further. But we're going to pick this up again because this is really, really important that we can see the way these healing manifestations happen and really encourage us, depending on, you know, so we know where we're at along the manifestation of our healing, what we're believing anything, you know, of God for, that there's different ways it happens. And every one of these ways is awesome, right? Amen. So, Father, we thank you for an opportunity to be here this morning. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you that it's alive to us, Father, and that the word never fails, always works in our lives, and that we have new, deeper light and revelation on that in all areas, in all your promised areas to us, Father, that we would just go deeper with you, never let go, and only lay hold of what we're believing you for by faith. Quite honestly, we're just believe you. And we thank you for that. We thank you that you're just so awesome. We just say bring glory to yourself this morning. And we thank you for everything you said and did here this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen and amen. So before you guys uh, sign off on live stream, I just want to make an announcement. You guys may have seen this on a Facebook post uh, yesterday. June 8th and 9th, Tuesday, Wednesday, Brother Keith Moore will be here for two nights. So glory to God, he's coming back. Um, he was here back in September of 2019, and it was, you know, just, just, just amazing. So mark your calendars. Uh, I know the Spirit of the Lord is going to speak through him. You know, I know he doesn't go anywhere unless he knows he's supposed to go. And I know that he's going to have a message for us, you know, just for us. So mark your calendars for uh, the 8th and the 9th, and we'll give you a little bit more details as we get a little bit closer to this. But um, and invite your friends. Amen.
Glory to God. We love you guys. Have an awesome, beautiful Friday afternoon, and we'll see you in church on Sunday morning 